from Spam 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 Humbug. I'm Kenneth Cooley, better known as WTF Dragon, and this is a complete reading of Andrea Cantato's Through the Moongate. Chapter 7, Ultima. It was the first game I ever wrote on the Apple II. When I finished it, I went, wow, that game sold 30,000 units. I never even meant to sell it. It doesn't have a story. There's no way to win it. I thought, wow, I could do a much better game if I just started over. And so I began the first Ultima. Richard Garriott, Richard Garriott, Online Game Pioneers at Work by Morgan Ramsey. Ken actually did all the machine language programming on it so we could use tile graphics. If you think back to the days of the original Ultima, I don't think there was a game that used tile graphics at that stage. So I believe that we, principally Ken, invented tile graphics for Ultima. Richard Garriott, The Official Book of Ultima by Shay Adams. Ultima's story was not a sequel to Acalabeth's. Today, we would say it was a reboot, as Garriott himself, realizing the substantial absence of plot in his first game, decided to start from scratch, leaving only a few points of connection between his first and second games. The shadow of the evil wizard Mondain obscured the lands of Caesarea, a world divided into four continents, each controlled by two kings, and threatened to destroy them with hordes of monsters. Caesarea's last hope was the stranger, the only one capable of defeating Mondain. Strangely enough, in Acalabeth's introduction, this arch-enemy had already been driven out by Lord British, yet in Ultima, he was in control of deadly forces, and, indeed, immortal, having forged a magical object of incredible power, the Gem of Immortality. To bring down Mondain and end his reign of terror and destruction, the stranger had to find a way to go back in time and defeat him before he built the gem, while he was still mortal. Exploring the lands of Caesarea and performing various feats, some of which resembled Lord British's assignments in Acalabeth, the player would obtain the gems needed to operate the time machine. Once again, the reference to Dungeons & Dragons was clear, but this time the character creation system was no longer random. The player had to distribute 90 points between strength, toughness, agility, wisdom, intelligence, and charisma, ranging from 6 to 20 for each. The next step was to choose the race, selecting Human, Elf, Dwarf, and Hobbit, another Tolkien reference, which only applied race-specific bonuses and penalties. Richard didn't deviate from the clichés of fantasy, giving strength bonuses to dwarves and agility to elves, except for the human race, which he decided had an increased intelligence by five points. After selecting the character's sex, without any effect on gameplay, the last step was to choose the avatar's class, warrior, cleric, magician, or thief. With Acalabeth, Richard had already tried to implement a system of classes that changed the gameplay. The warrior could use more powerful weapons, and the magician had more effective access to the only magic object, the amulet. But the outcome of this attempt was modest, if anything. In Ultima, class played a slightly more important part, as it mainly guaranteed an additional bonus, plus 10 strength for the warrior, plus 10 intelligence to the magician, and so on, and also limited the available equipment. Stored on a 5 quarter inch floppy disk, Ultima was able to save game data, and then the player would create their own character, store it on a disk, and start the game. It was necessary to copy the second side of the original floppy, called Player Master, onto an empty disk, creating the Player Disk, before starting the game from the first floppy, called the Program Disk. This favored players with two floppy drives. Saving, present in the first prototypes of D&D but lacking in Acalabeth, was essential for Ultima because of the game's length. In interviews, Garriott claimed technical reasons for why it was not possible to save during the descent into the game's dungeons. The game would start with the usual top-down view of the world, but now a bigger world, with color, visually nicer tiles, with Ken Arnold's assembly routines working in the background to add unprecedented fluidity and detail. It was possible to explore the world freely, but to complete the adventure it was necessary to find one of the eight castles to receive one's first mission. And because of the far greater variety of actions that players could take in the game, the interface now consisted of substantially more hotkeys. The castles of the Lords of Caesarea were open to visitors, and led the player to maps with special tiles including guards, traders, trees, and members of the royal court, typically the king, a princess, and the jester. With the T key for transact, it was possible to trade with merchants or talk to hosts and lords. This was an interesting step forward from Acalabeth, where castles and cities had a textual representation and shops were the same everywhere. The player could also attack the guards or steal food, that was the S hotkey, and equipment. Richard also included the first NPC, a jester, wandering the streets of the city singing, Ho, yo, hey, hum. In the cities and castles of Caesarea, Garriott's most popular characters would make their debut. Yolo and Gwino, present as jesters in the courts of each of the eight castles, 
were inspired by David Yolo Watson and Kathleen Gweno Jones. And of course, Garriott's other alter ego, Shamino, sovereign of one of the four continents, the Lands of Danger and Despair, was also present in the game. The first mission was visiting a point of interest, or as in Akalabeth, defeating a certain monster. The first big surprise was that Akalabeth's turn-based system had been replaced by a rudimentary real-time system, very similar to Temple of Apshai. If the player didn't take any action for a few seconds, the game continued, and enemies made their moves, forcing the player to act. This applied only to the surface map. For the dungeons, the system remained exclusively turn-based. The mechanics for fights didn't change. A dealt attacks while dexterity affected success. Power determined the damage. Happily, a single ready action, hotkey R, existed to equip weapons and armor, replacing the previous system of repeatedly asking the player which weapon they wanted to use before every battle. Dungeons were generated at the start of the game using the player's name as a seed. Monsters appeared randomly based on the level of the dungeon. Finding the right monster to complete hunting missions was just a matter of luck and perseverance. One big novelty was the system of spells, no longer based on the use of an object like the magic amulet of a Calabeth. Ultimately, all characters could buy spells in cities and use them, mainly in dungeons, which required readying them first. Given the high cost, the player was encouraged to use disposable scrolls sparingly. Spells were divided into two sets, those available to any character and those exclusive to wizards. The latter were understandably more powerful and gave new tactics, allowing a player to teleport a short distance with Blink, an extreme solution that could get the player into an even worse situation than the one that he was trying to escape from, or to create a magical wall in front of themselves with Create, or to destroy one with Destroy, and even to slay monsters outright using the spell Kill. For all other classes, the basic spells were very similar to those of the Akalabeth Amulet, with small innovations. The player could go up or down a level in the dungeons, create magic lightning with magic missile, a spell very familiar to D&D players, or reduce the risk of triggering traps from opening coffins and chests with the use of open. A Calibeth's bad spell, prone to abuse, was somehow replaced by prayer, with random but beneficial effects, such as removing a close enemy or adding food or hit points in the overworld. After completing missions on the first three continents, it became necessary to travel into space. Nowadays it may seem strange to mix fantasy and sci-fi, and Garriott made no attempt to explain it in Ultima. The cover of the little manual showed an artwork with a warrior, a dragon, a castle in the clouds, and a spaceship, very similar to the space shuttle, and made it clear that the game would include sci-fi elements. In fact, in the 70s and 80s, the mix of fantasy and sci-fi, also called science fantasy, was not uncommon. For example, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, published in 1980, an expansion module, written by Gary Gygax for Dungeons & Dragons, was set inside a spaceship whose crew had been exterminated. Players had to survive hordes of robots and strange creatures, probably of alien origin, as well as finding advanced technology to proceed with the plot. This adventure wasn't an isolated case, but belonged to a fairly popular niche, reaching peak popularity with the Spelljammer setting, published in 1989. The space section in Ultima was completely different from the other game parts. After docking at a space station, the player experienced a series of action sections, shooting down enemy spaceships curiously similar to the Star Wars twin ion engine, that is, TIE, fighter. The combat was reminiscent of Doug Neubauer's Star Raiders, released a couple of years prior for the Atari 800, with a slight difference in controls. In the Atari game, the player moved the crosshair to direct the focus of the laser toward enemy fighters, while Ultima used fixed crosshairs, and therefore required players to center enemies in the middle of the screen in order to attack them. Garriott later admitted that he was greatly influenced by Neubauer's primitive space combat game. References to George Lucas's film continued with other pieces of equipment available in the advanced part of Ultima, such as blaster weapons and lightsabers. After this first appearance, the cinematic references in Garriott's works would increase over time. He also claimed that he had been less inspired by literary works and much more by films from his youth, a passion he shared with many of his later colleagues. After destroying 20 enemy space vessels, the player would return to Caesarea and receive the last missions in the lands of danger and despair. Once these were all completed, all that was left to do was find the time machine. To do so, it was necessary to save a princess, freeing her from her imprisonment. The only way to open the lock to her cell was to kill the city jester. Jesters would repeatedly claim to have the key throughout the course of the game. Contrary to later installments, which rewarded the player's good behavior, in Ultima, killing, looting, and theft were not only possible strategies to reach the final goal, but were in fact essential. Without any kind of narrative explanation, the player had to kill the jester in cold blood to retrieve the cell key. Once the princess was freed, the player was then able to reach the time machine and go back a thousand years to challenge Mondane in a boss fight. 
The battle with the evil wizard took place in a completely empty city map, showing only the player, Mondain, and a small dot indicating the Gem of Immortality. Although the journey through time was intended to arrive before the gem was built, at the beginning of the fight, the gem was already in existence, and its magical power active, giving Mondain the ability to regenerate shortly after being killed. To complete the mission, the player had to fight Mondain long enough to get close to the gem and interact with it, breaking it, and permanently depriving his arch enemy of the regeneration ability. After killing Mondain again, the player was transported by Lord British, who informed him of this final victory and, as with Calabeth, asked him to inform California Pacific Computer Company at 1623 Fifth Street, Suite B, Davis, California, 95616. As such, in 1981, Ultima was highly out of the ordinary, and many of its features later became genre standards. Its vast worlds using tessellated game maps and freedom of exploration impressed the public and inspired programmers. Conversely, the choice to include such a variety of themes without a clear vision resulted in serious problems that showed Richard's naivety. But it was also a stepping stone in his progress towards creating a fun game with a rich and stimulating world. His main goal was to entertain the player and to make the most out of the resources available on the Apple II. According to Richard, Eventually your character will discover the real object of the game. Accomplishing this is no small undertaking. It requires experience, imagination, and a lot of hit points. John Williams, Softline, September 1981, Review of Ultima. If you look at Ultima 1-3, to they really were pulling from all the things I thought were cool in life. There were lightsabers and blasters and land speeders and such in the first few Ultimas from, of course, Star Wars. There were tons of influences from Lord of the Rings. The basic was an amalgamation of all the things I found inspirational around me during those times. In the still young gaming industry, where many titles were one-person projects, games like Temple of Apshai advertised having been tested by seven people, a remarkably small amount compared to modern game testing, and hence hitting the market with numerous bugs and prone to crashing. Richard would also resort to his friends and members of the SCA for testing, but the resulting bugs were similar. For example, in Dungeons, the resistance of the player's armor wasn't taken into account in damage calculations, making it easy for those more experienced to abuse to manipulate many of the game's mechanics by traveling between points of interest and then receiving repeated weapon upgrades and wisdom bonuses. Other features, such as experience, made little sense as, unlike in Dungeons & Dragons, this feature did not upgrade one's character or grant them special skills, but rather increased the number of monsters in the overworld. What mattered were the character statistics, which rose upon the completion of quests or were granted by Lord British. The only innovation about hit points was the possibility to buy them from the Lords of Castles, but once exhausted, the player's character was immediately regenerated with 99 hit points and 99 points of food, though they lost all experience, money, and equipment. Ultima was published by California Pacific Computer Company in June of 1981. The first version contained a 5 quarter inch floppy disk, a manual written by Richard Garriott, Al Remmers, and Tom Lurz, as well as a small four-page reference guide. This time, the cover artwork, a medieval knight in front of a metal dragon, was designed by Dennis LeBay. According to LeBay, This was the first actual commission I ever got from Richard Garriott, and he offered it to me while I was working at Steve Jackson Games. At the same time, Richard asked me to do the startup screen for Ultima 1 as well. I did it on an Apple II graphics tablet that was so crudely constructed that the pen would fall apart, and the line you were drawing would constantly be interrupted by power spikes from the cobbled together electronics. That was the first computer graphics I ever did. In the years to come, the game was republished several times, often with significant changes. In the first reissue of Ultima, in 1983, by Sierra Online for Atari's 8-bit line of computers, Lubay's cover art was replaced with a new design depicting a castle with similar lines to the artwork of the CPCC version reference guide. In the meantime, Ultima 2 had been released, which made Ultima part of a series. Therefore, the edition for Atari was published under the name Ultima 1, the original. After his time with Sierra Online ended, Richard had to wait until 1986 to be able to republish Ultima. The game was published after a significant improvement to its graphics, first for the Apple II, and then months later for the Commodore 64 and for IBM PCs. This latter version, in particular, supported the new EGA video cards, and was able to represent 16 colors rather than 4. All 1986 editions were published by Origin Systems with the name Ultima One, The First Age of Darkness. And the boxes contained a paper map of the four continents of Caesarea, a bag with five coins, one gold, three silver, and one copper, a reference manual, and the book The First Age of Darkness, written by Garriott and illustrated by Lubay. In the gaming industry, illustrations and higher quality materials were gradually becoming more common, and Richard, more than any other programmer, was ready to use this to his advantage. But 
He needed luck. Luck, however, was about to turn its back on Richard. To learn more, subscribe to Spam 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 Humbug on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Anchor.fm at anchor.fm slash SSSH podcast or at spam 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 humbug.com. To find out more about Through the Moongate, visit thera.it. That's T H E I R A dot I T. You can also find the book on Amazon. And of course, you can learn more about the book and its author at andreacantado.com. That's A N D R E A C O N T A T O dot com. A big thank you to author Andrea Cantato for not only undertaking the effort of writing through the Moongate, but also for agreeing to allow for it to be read to you in this and following Spam 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 Humbug episodes. Tune in in a couple weeks' time for the next chapter. I'm going to make some games and I'll show them to you when I'm done.